are at the at Mexico at the World Future Studies Federation conference, and I'm speaking to Stuart Candia this time. Stuart, tell the folks back home who you are and also to the world. Sure. Um, so, hi everyone. My name's Stuart Candy. I, I'm an experiential futurist. It means I design and stage experiences that feel like they're happening in the future. And uh, with my colleagues and students and collaborators, I um, create tools to make it easier for other people to do the same thing. Basically, to bring the future to life materially and immersively in the present. Why are people so obsessed with the future? Um, well. Uh, The, the future is a synonym for all possibilities uh, that could come. And so it contains literally everything that hasn't happened yet, multiplied by everything that could happen, uh, which is a pretty um, bewitching space because all of our hopes and fears, our dreams, in a sense, are located in the future. Even if they refer to uh, things in history or in the past that we would like to bring back, um, it's the future where those possibilities reside. So I think it's a persistent human concern and obsession that comes out of the kind of minds that we have, which are um, capable of imagining things that aren't directly in front of us. Can you clarify to us uh, what futurism really is? What is foresight? And specifically, what is strategic foresight? Yeah, so um, futures studies or strategic foresight... Um, Actually, most practitioners probably don't call it futurism so much, uh, although that is a term that, that some people like. Partly the reason why we tend to avoid it is because there's already an art movement from the early 20th century in Italy uh, called futurism, um, along with surrealism and, and uh, Dadaism and that, <laughs> those sorts of things. But so people who practice futures or who study them are, um, as I see it, systematically and creatively trying to understand possibility space. They're trying to Uh, navigate change by imagining more effectively today what the um, options are that they have and what the consequences of different kinds of decision are. And um, futures studies is maybe more of a, uh, the academic term and strategic foresight is possibly what um, consulting people call it more often, but there's a big overlap and it's all concerned with um, understanding things that haven't happened yet in a way that helps you take action today. In, in, in your view, what is the difference between studying history and studying futurism? Well, the, the, the uh, obvious difference is that history has happened and the future has not, which is why um, we call it futures with an S. That S uh, is very important. And I mean, maybe this is sort of a, uh, you know, a quirk of English, of the English language that adding S makes such a big difference. But... Um, When we try to understand things that haven't happened yet, we need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that it's open. It is to be determined. It's unwritten. Um, that doesn't mean that absolutely anything could happen at absolutely any time, but it does mean that the effort to predict a singular pathway is a bit misguided because it's however compelling a particular image of the future might be, It's inevitably only part of the bigger picture, which is um, uh, which is all possibilities. So, um, yeah, that, I mean, I, my first degree was in history, and so I think of futures as, uh, in a way, a form of applied history. It's not the opposite of it, even though um, they, the way we talk about it, might face temporally in opposite directions. Many of the same. Uh, kinds of question about patterns of change and what leads to what and why um, apply to both. So the best futurists are also historians. When you speak about alternative futures, is it prediction or is it analysis? Um, well, you're only giving me two choices there and I don't well, know that it's either. So I, I think it's actually more synthesis and imagination. Okay. And then you can analyze on the basis of what you imagine. So um, alternative futures are, are I'm going to say, by definition, not predictive. A prediction is about trying to say what is going to happen. Alternative futures uh, as, a, as a concept is an, uh, the notion that many different things could happen. So um, the... Uh, The notion of what is most probable, what seems likely, what is kind of what we are on track to, uh, to see happen in, um, in history or in our organizations or in our lives, 
um, is an important question, but it's a smallest subset of a bigger question, which is what are the range of possible futures look like and how can we navigate them in directions that we would like to live in? That's, I think, the relationship between those things. Um, so there's a, uh, a synthesis element or an imaginative element because, you know, again, by definition, the future is not what is directly in front of you and around you. That is the present, or if you take it kind of literally, it's sort of the recent past. Because even by the time an image uh, has been processed by our brains, <laughs> it's already gone. Um, but uh, uh, the, the idea that alternative futures are the wider territory than prediction, I think, is a very enabling one. And it's a, because it invites the question of agency. What can we do with our imaginations, with our understanding of systems to, uh, to move in desired directions? You talk a lot about design. What is it actually? <laughs> That's a big question. So I'm a, um, an associate professor at Carnegie Mellon University uh, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, U USA, um, in the School of Design. Um, but my background is not in design, so I've come to it as an outsider, um, but actually as a futurist already, because um, design is where we, sh is the, a kind of, you know, the profession that shapes the world materially. Uh, I mean, it can take the form of architecture, of course, um, uh, although, you know, in, uh, commonly we think of that as being a sort of a completely separate um, a profession or a separate activity, but if you think about what designers of all kinds do, they basically bring or attempt to bring the desired uh, into being. And in that sense, everyone designs. Um, there's a, uh, a Nobel laureate uh, professor from um, uh, Carnegie Mellon in the 20th century, Herb Simon, who sort of says that everyone designs who um, acts to turn existing situations into preferred ones. Mm -hmm. So everyone designs, but not everybody is a designer. And I'm interested in design really for two reasons. One is that the designers, uh, designers basically make decisions on behalf of everyone that yeah. we all have to live with. Yeah. And they do those, they make those decisions kind of partly on the basis of the futures that they are able to imagine and the things that they don't imagine. So we can, by accident, find our way into circumstances that nobody intended or wanted, even though they were designed. So there's a need, I think, for designers to be able to think about alternative futures in order to be able to design more uh, wisely, um, you know, in light of the different futures that they want to bring into being and those that they would like to avoid. Most of the time it probably won't work, but it definitely won't work if they don't even think about it. Um, the, the other reason why I am interested in design is because those same practices of bringing things into material existence um, provide something that futures studies and foresight as a field ha has traditionally lacked, which is um, a direct relationship to materiality. So when we talk about the future, you know, we're kind of weaving webs of words. Um, and we're talking about what we imagine, but we can, I think, explore those possibility spaces more effectively and more collectively by, by using design and film and uh, theater and other media to bring those things to life as if they were happening now. Okay. And so design is kind of a, is an umbrella of convenience actually for an agenda that is a bit broader than that and that is about taking ideas about the future out of the abstract and bringing them into um, concrete existence in the language of experience. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Cheers.